Welcome everyone. This is Aesthetic Impact uh, May offering for target review and it's a special night. We have an outbounder target that folks have been turning in sessions on at intervals throughout the month. A couple over two or three I think we have been retasking. So we'll have two sessions from some viewers to record. Uh, we have a few new people here this evening who are listening for the first or second time. And we hope that this is kind of an unusual evening and we have a lot of learning points that if you guys didn't share your remote viewing sessions, we wouldn't have anything to talk about. We can talk about sterile manuals all you want. You learn 5% of remote viewing information and can, we teach controlled remote viewing in Lynn's student group but we welcome everybody to come. Any methodology to these discussions, turn in sessions, and you don't have to turn in sessions, you can just come and listen, so everybody is welcome. But uh, we do have several learning opportunities this evening, and I'm kind of excited about it, things we don't usually do. And with that, I'm gonna switch over to my desktop, and I'll bring up the feedback and intro at least what the target is, and then we'll look at sessions and we will turn it over to our outbounder who is here. And you will learn that um, you moved in time and space to the event, which you do during most of your sessions anyway. You just don't really think about it because as I was starting to say, five minute or five percent of what you learn about remote viewing is from the manual. The other 95 percent is practice. And if you have a group to share sessions with and discuss the sessions, because people perceive things differently, you learn a lot more. So we're grateful to be able to get together, grateful that all of you were able to send in your sessions and share them, and grateful that Lynn is able to come and share his knowledge and expertise online. So let, as I was saying, um, our outbounder target this month for discussion is 140514, and I'm going to switch over now to my desktop and let you have a look at the feedback and see who our mystery outbounder is. Let me get my screens up so I can see who is making comments, and there we go. Okay. And our mystery outbounder is, does anybody recognize this svelte gentleman in the photo standing in front of the ship? Some of you have not met him in person, but this is Lynn Buchanan. And Lynn, I had this photo that Lynn shared with me a long time ago, so all I did was use this one photo as my feedback photo, and I was going to embellish it and add text and what was going on at the site and, and uh, a lot more information. And I thought, now, wait a minute. We have the opportunity to show all of you that, because when you think about it, how many bazillion times by now has the Eiffel Tower been remote viewed? And who all used the same coordinates? Virtually nobody. So here is the same target with coordinates 08, 04, 09. So I thought instead of me making up a document with a bunch of information on it, I will leave this one and show you Lynn's thorough learning target. Sorry, I'm adjusting these windows here, as you can see. And here you can see the hydrofoil boats that were used. Uh, I have been, I did some research on them and uh, it's somewhat sad. They decommissioned all of them uh, as of, I think, 2009. There is one that it remains, it doesn't, and these are just, these are glorious boats. I was in mourning 
Um, there's one that's been stripped down to just a gray hull, and it's in Missouri. It's been to towed up the river. No, it went under its own power. It doesn't have any of the special equipment on it, and the hydrofoil part is gone. Um, but they're hoping to fund it and make it into a, a museum. That one remains, and the one that Lynn is standing in front of under, in this photo has been converted into a yacht. So other than that, these boats are no longer in use, but they are glorious things. And I will turn this over to Lynn, who can tell you all about this event, and I will move to the appropriate picture when he tells me. And we'll go over sessions, and you will actually have somebody who was at this event to give you feedback. So Lynn, you want to please and thank you, cue up your mic. And uh, I will just shush and let you tell everybody about this event. And then we can look at some sessions if that's all right. In five, four, three, Great. Lynn? Um, hang on. Maybe I have too many mics out. Over there. There's Lynn. Hi. Oh. You're working. Okay. I have a mic now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Uh, I think I just passed out mics willy-nilly, and once I hit seven, that's the limit. So... I think okay. you were on the tail end. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, um, if you would like to go ahead and, and just tell us about the event, and then we'll look at some sessions, if that's okay. Okay. Basically, this was a classified mission we were on, and uh, we went down to Key West, Florida, and uh, we were in uh, anti-submarine warfare planes, Buzz in the Caribbean, uh, finding which <clears throat> ships uh, had drugs on them, and we were working for uh, uh, Task Force Five, which was a uh, drug vesting group. Um, the, uh, the one afternoon we were down there, and they said, "Well." Have you seen our ships? And we said no. And they said, well, they're very proud of them. So they took us out to see the hydrofoils. And uh, these are amazing ships. Uh, they fly above the water. Now, normally, they will just float in the water. <clears throat> and on that, um, on that next picture, you see the uh, uh, foil, the wing, tucked up behind the ship. When they um, have to chase one of these uh, cigarette boats, which are really, really fast, uh, <clears throat> they lower those wings front and back into the water, and they have turbojet water jets, and they um, they take off, and these things can go like 60 miles an hour, which can outrun any uh, cigarette boat. I don't know if you know that term. Um, a cigarette boat is not one that hauls cigarettes. <laughs> it's uh, uh, a long, thin uh, uh, boat, usually, boat that usually carries like three or four people. And it will uh, go really, really fast. They have these small boats that are like canoes, and they put out. Somebody's got a phone ringing. <laughs> it's me. And I... Oh, okay. You know, one of the neat things about phones, if you ignore them, they give up. Uh, but these uh, cigarette boats will be more like a, uh, almost like a canoe, and they put in uh, motors that are going to drive a, a huge uh, yacht, and so they have tremendous speed, and the only way they can catch them is if they go airborne, or what they call foil-borne, and, uh, uh, 
and just fly above the water, and then they can catch them. On a lot of these, um, you'll see uh, on this top, there's a big bulby thing there on the front of the ship. Those were not on the front of the ship that we were at. Uh, what they can do is they can uh, uh, put metal shields up over the windows and over any ports and doors and all, and uh, they can come up behind one of these fast flying, you know, these fast uh, going cigarette boats, drop the front foil, and this whole ship goes under the water and then bobs back up with that cigarette boat sitting on the front deck. <laughs> and the drug runners are just, you know, uh, what do we do now? Anyway, um, in this top picture, you notice that light patch of, uh, of water that looks like it's going parallel to the ship. That's not. That thing turned that sharply in the water and so that's its trail that it came from. The thing turned on almost 180 degree turn and is immediately, you know, is still foil born. And uh, these things are so fast, you wouldn't believe. Anyway, that's the, um, the Pegasus class of ships. And, um, and so we got a tour of these and, uh, and we got to meet the fleet and everything. And, um, um it's just a it's a fantastic uh um fleet of ships that nobody in the US even knows existed and in fact I don't know why in the world they decommissioned them they shouldn't have uh when you go down to that third picture down there uh you see the uh marijuana leaves on, on this side um that's one for every capture that that ship made. And um, the bottom things down there are for uh, a lot rougher drugs than marijuana. Um, so anyway, that's that's skinny little me beside the ship. And uh, dressed in civvies because we never wore uniforms. We were... Uh, Plain clothes unit. Um, so anyway, if anybody has any questions, we can go ahead and look on the feedback map. It shows that we were down in uh, in Key West, where the uh, where the ships ran from. We were just that far from Havana, Cuba, and in fact, in the evenings, we would sit on the beach and watch the lights. From Havana, you could see the lights from Havana sitting on the beach there. Uh, if you remember the show Miami Vice, Crockett's boat was a cigarette boat. Okay, yeah, I never watched that show, but uh, but evidently you know what a cigarette boat was. Yeah. Okay. So that is the background, and Lynn is, uh, we have two outbounders this month, and uh, so here, let me minimize, I hope, this just a little bit. There we go. And I'm going to scoot this way over to the side. And we were, um, by the way, we were down there for uh, less than a week. And we were respons directly responsible for the seizure of um, the estimated uh, $52 million in, in drugs off of the uh, drug ships. And they said that that was just a drop in the bucket. They asked the government to have us down there full time, and the government said no. And uh, you know, if in the four days we were down there, we were just getting started and we were just learning how to uh, fly over these uh, big container ships and all those and uh, and not only specify whether the ship had drugs, but also where the drugs would be hidden on the ship. And 
these people at Task Force 5 just really, really wanted to have a remote viewing unit down there. And in fact, we were trained so they wanted us to be stationed down there. And the government said no. I have no idea why. All right, the first session I have up is Ron. And I figured out, I'm, I'm pretty sure that one of the reasons my computer has been locking up recently, and by the way, we have thunderstorms tonight. I think they've mostly passed. But um, is when we've had so many retaskings up, I've had an ungodly amount of sessions open, and I don't know that uh, it just will all work. So that's why I put them into shortcuts on my desktop so I don't have to fish around trying to find sessions, and I hope I have everyone's. So, all right, so this is Ron's, and Ron is here, and he's an intermediate student, and he's been on sabbatical for a little bit. Lots of, uh, we all have busy lives. But uh, he wasn't, a, he was kind of thinking maybe he needed to get his feet wet again. And... He's given himself movement, move to the time and place and describe, and that's what I did so that everybody didn't have to try, because with normal outbounders, people think that, okay, it's going to be a certain day at a certain time, and I have to do my session right then. But considering we get together once a month, I asked Lynn how we could overcome this, and we have different time zones, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how we devised just posting to use that move command. But um, Ashley, uh, I'm scrolling down through this. We're going to go right to any sketches that Ron has. And he says that uh, this is making his stomach churn, and it's a place to eat. So does that look familiar, Lynn? Oh, absolutely. We were taken down <clears throat> into the hold, and uh, what he's got pictured right there is exactly what's there. The uh, the seats are built into the wall. Uh, yeah. There's a table. It's a small table, and uh, the crew, you know, will take turns eating, but uh, the rest of the crew has to be on board and at their stations. And so, yeah, that's absolutely there. That's, I've been on ships, and it looks perfect to me, but yeah. uh, from what I remember. And then... He has a good summary here. So, summary of the target uh, is the target site is a location with elements of man-made natural motion, land, liquid, and people. Man-made appears hard with brown crust. There's a lemon smell in the air. Something has a sweet, tart taste. Hard, there's a round object that is white and feels oily and powdery. The natural is rolling. A tumbling cylindrical metallic cage-like device is encasing something flowery. It is me metallic and shiny. The coffee smell is overwhelming. The place is located near a busy highway from the car sound. The motion is moving up and down. It makes a chur churry sound. Okay, uh, Teresa? Yeah. Instead of reading all this and then having yeah. me feedback, could we go like sentence at a time? Sure. Okay. Uh, do you want to read it, or should I? Well, How do you want to do that? Thing. I can't see the whole thing on the screen right now. It's uh, up at the very top. There you mm -hmm. go. Um, keep going up. Okay. I can reduce the size to 75%. And okay. Yeah, that's good. Can you read it okay? Yeah. Okay. Right. Man-made natural motion heart. Um, Land, liquid, and people, that's all there. In fact, that is a description of the gestalts of the site. Uh, the man-made appeared hard, yes, with a brown crust. Um, not at the time. Now, if these have been mothballed, they may be rusting now, but uh, not at the time. Um, there is a... Lemon smell. Lemon smell. Thank you. And he he seems to be in in the mess hall or whatever. Excuse the old man while he gets his reading glasses. Um, well, I'm wondering uh, if he's smelling food. So. Yeah, there was saying. a lemon. There was a lemony smell. 
um, and there was a coffee smell, uh, the lemony smell coming from cleaning. Um, as far as the sweet and tart taste, I can't feed back on that. Uh, there's a round object that's white and feels oily and powdery. The big round um, objects all over the ship were white. And in fact, the ship that we were on was painted white. Everything on top was painted white. Um, the uh, There was an oily feel to much of it. As far as the powdery, I can't feed back. Uh, but a few things did feel oily because they have to keep them greased up to uh, prevent the salt water uh, from corroding them. Uh, the natural is rolling. Uh, yeah, the, the whole thing was sitting in the water. And this is not so large a ship that um, that the waves don't toss the thing back and forth a little. Uh, tumbling cylindrical metallic cage-like device is encasing something. Um, I am not sure I can feed back on that unless it was the uh, rocket tubes at the back of the ship. They have a whole battery of rocket tubes back there um, and they are in closed uh, cylinders which uh, which are sort of square in, in shape and all that. That could be what it was. Uh, something flowery? I don't think so. It's metallic and shiny. Yep, the coffee smell is overwhelming. It wasn't overwhelming. Uh, but then <laughs> we were there in the morning and wanting coffee anyway. Um, however, the Navy is sort of famous for making their coffee so that, you know, uh, after you drop seven creamers in, it begins to change color. Um, okay. Let me just point out that the viewer is in charge of the session, and to the viewer, the coffee smell was overwhelming, but maybe not to you. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, good point, yeah. Uh, I lost my place. Sorry. Uh, uh, near a busy highway, yep. Uh, from the car sounds, yep. Uh, in fact, it's not that far from the entrance to that Navy base. Uh, <clears throat> the motion is mainly up and down, yep. It makes a churning sound, yes. They keep the motors going all the time because they've got to be on 24-hour alert. Uh, there seems to be a Mother. buzzer, yeah. uh, which which sounds associated with the movements. I whistle never sounds written. with the what? Whistle sounds. Oh, whistle sounds associated with the movements. I um, I can't feed back on that. I don't know. They may have you know uh, ships have the whistle sounds, and, and I have no idea on that. Uh, the land appears hard. Yep. Uh, it's an uneven surface, which is gray. It's gray, but it was very even. Um, in fact, they had, um, this is one of the hugest boat ramps I think I've ever seen. Uh, from, from where we were, the, uh, the place was flat and went easily the size of two football fields out around the water. Uh, there are yellow and red accents. Yes, absolutely. They had lines and everything painted and, you know, danger signs and don't cross this line and everything else, you know. Um, a sour milk smell, I don't remember anything like that. The liquid is wet. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, burning hot? No. Uh, it appears black and shiny. The uh, people appear tall, short, and heavy. Uh, tall and short, but the Navy's even worse than the Army is about the heavy. Um, there seems to be many people. Um, something up. Lined up. Lined up. Uh, yeah. Wearing colors of blue. They were not lined up. Everybody was at their station. Uh, blue. 
uh, orange, green, brown, black, and red. Uh, yes. Uh, they appeared to be satisfied. Yeah, they really did. I think they enjoy working there. Uh, this is not like most Navy ships in peacetime where, you know, they just make business. This one was on the go, you know, on the go on, on a moment's notice. So, yeah. Uh, and then he listed his straight cast of pastry, McDonald's, and Starbucks. No, I would have to say no to each one of those. Uh, at that there, time, at that they're time, reminding him of food, though, and he kept setting them aside. They're a straight cat. Okay, yeah. Um, but uh, we didn't have anything to eat while we were there. We did get some coffee, and uh, I was kind of afraid if I walked over and poured it into the ocean, the ocean would turn black. So. I didn't, uh, <laughs> but uh, at that time, um, civilian places were not allowed on military bases. Of course, now if you're owned by the Chinese like McDonald's is, you can have McDonald's on all the military bases. Slight comment there, anyway. Um, good session. Very good. I was going to say, Ron, did you want to uh, chime in? Do you have any comments? Oh, good. Your mic. Oh, maybe I you need a mic. I can take a mic away and just. I need to uh, just renegotiate some folks here and shuffle mics. Not Lynn. There we go. Ron. Hmm. I'm trying to make Ron a panelist. He already is a panelist. Okay, Ron, um, you do have a mic according to my screen if you want to make it live or if you'd like to type in any comments. I'm watching the text box. But yeah, I agree with Lynn. Um, you had a lot of good perceptions, and the fact that your sketch shows that you were the galley, that's the word I'm trying to go for. Um, I think you kind of landed in the galley, and you had a lot of smells that would be, and, and so on, that would be associated with food. If at some point you want to make a comment, Ron, you feel free to type it in or flag me and get my attention, please. Thanks for sending in a session. I appreciate it. And actually, I should close that. Smells of the uh, cleaning stuff. I was kind of surprised that they seem to be using lemon pledge or something like that uh, instead of just military cleaner. Uh, but I imagine when you're cooped up in a place like that uh, uh, for long periods of time, you don't really don't want to smell. Uh, I thought maybe the cook cleaners. made a lemon pie, but what do I know? No, uh, -uh. no, there was no food out when we were there. I always figured they could be fixing it in the back, but what do I know? Well, all right. Yeah. That's, that's I know you were really you didn't see it there. <laughs> right because you didn't see it but that's like uh, winking about the site just because you didn't going. see it it's didn't still mean they waffling it. it's still waffling <laughs> I hear you I'm not gonna do that <laughs> I hear you okay scrolling down through Michelle's Michelle's session she has 20 pages and looking for sketches and then we'll get to her summary and you can feed back. So here is her first sketch and she makes a comment almost like a summer camp cottage or barrack of some sort. Actually there were no barracks there. There may have been off across the base but uh, where we were was just a 
basically a humongous uh, port. Now, in this picture here, you have a building which was not there when we were uh, at the place where we were. But I can see where, you know, a building like this uh, could tend to match what she what she has shown there. But this was not where where we were in that second picture there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then she has um, wide open space, then this huge mass of rock formation, taller than a skyscraper, broad like many something fused together or a small mountain. Uh, except for the tall, um, yeah. that ship area where we were, the boat ramp dock and all that, mm -hmm. uh, was humongous. They had a uh, uh, sort of a frame there that would uh, that had four legs and the top had a winch, and the uh, thing was large enough that it could move out into the water, straddle one of these ships, pick the thing up, and bring it back on the land. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen a crane. That big, and I mean, it had four legs and would roll. Uh, you know, they could drive it to wherever they wanted. Then her next sketch says, "I'm seeing men checking ropes, hooks, and harnesses. No, A lot of nouns there." Yeah. That was more for Michelle's benefit. Lots of nouns. How would you describe those ropes, hooks, and harnesses? Yep. Mm -hmm. A lot of her sea, she's right so much, you know, like she wins, but you know, I always have to remind her, yep. nouns, describe, mm -hmm. nouns. <laughs> so does this look appropriate, this particular sketch, no matter what she says, the bottom she one, thinks it is. Right, the bottom one does, the top one. Um, mm -hmm. What got me was that uh, they did have a radar that showed their position in the water and other boats and all that, but they didn't seem to have anything except the radio that would, uh, you know, show them, give them commands or, or let them communicate with the shore or anything else. It seemed to be just purely radio. So as far as that top part of the sketch, you know, where they have a, a situation board right. or situation screen, uh, right. that wasn't there. Now, the bottom part, yeah, you're going to find that on any ship. Mm -hmm. So for the newer people here tonight, would you, Michelle, uh, your, Michelle's conscious mind is saying that this is what she's seeing, but in remote viewing, it's your subconscious and conscious working together, and perceptions are descriptors, not nouns. And so you venture into some dangerous imaginative territory if you actually say what is going on in the picture, because you the picture could be perfectly correct, but your interpretation and analysis and session of what's going on might be incorrect. And so that's why we stick with describing what she is saying are the ho ho ropes, hooks, and harnesses, which, it, like Lynn said, are actually found on ships. Way to go, Michelle. Yeah. Yeah, but as far as the nouns are concerned, if you, like if one of those nouns was wrong, mm -hmm. uh, and she put faith in the noun, mm -hmm. um, it would lead her off in a totally wrong direction, and so on. And um, this is this is why we always say in remote viewing, you describe, you don't identify, because, you know, some vehicle may be big and yellow and uh, could be a big yellow submarine, but you call it a school bus 
And man, you have just locked yourself into castle building on using nothing but your imagination. And so you try to stay away from those nouns. They will kill a remote viewing session. And she says, purpose of the target, nature area of great beauty and danger. And so then her summary. That's true, but that was not the purpose. Um, uh, the target All right, so there you go. Motion biologicals in water, absolutely correct on all of them. The land is slanted. Um, <clears throat> actually, somewhat, yes. Uh, this is South Florida and, uh, you know, in one of these keys and uh, uh, high point on one of these keys might be 20 feet above water. <laughs> and so uh, slanted and angled. Uh, that's true, but uh, I mean, we're not talking steep here. Warm, absolutely dusty, yes. Western light, absolutely, yeah, it was, which is sort of surprising. Uh, far out on its own, yeah, you saw the map. Um, shallow, soiled, oh, shallow soil, absolutely. I mean, you dig down one inch and you're into coral, you know. Uh, hard bed rock, vast. Uh, flat. The land is not vast, however the uh, area is. I mean, you can, like I say, you can sit there and watch the lights in Havana. Um, <clears throat> hot risings, yeah, that's a key. Big bumped, arid, uh, surprisingly so, yes. Uh, rocky swirled, yeah. Night sky showy, you betcha. Oh, beautiful night sky. Uh, stark, yeah, rugged, yep. Yeah. Uh, truck mounted, um, no, trunk. Um, looks more Mon like trunk monumented. I'm not sure what that means. I can't feedback on that. Uh, sheer rock, yeah. Wide open, yep. Yeah. Sleepy, leave, sleeping vistas, yeah. Sweeping vistas, yeah. Okay, the land is. Uh, dusty, sparkly, crunchy, tan, orangey, uh, rusty reds, pinks, grays, pale, cocoa color, all yes. Um, large, wavy, uneven rings of, no, uh, this is under land. I think I would have to say no. Circular patterns, uh, I think I would have to say no. Iceberg cut, no. Um, actually, way back in prehistoric times, I think that, um, like half of Florida was lost into the sea. I'm not sure about this. I can't feed that. Anyway, sweeping, steep horizon. Uh, no. Man made his blocky crude, straight squared. Eh. Uh, flat sheeted, yeah, unadorned, yeah. Um, pale butter yellow, no. Um, rough wooden trim, no. Wooden beam, no. Guardhouse like, absolutely. Um, simple shape, yeah. Uh, kind of complexified up, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, landscape blended, uh, yeah. Reddish brick floor, no. Uh, informational, yes. Rest stop light, uh, could be. Emergency stationist, absolutely, yes. <laughs> Lighthouse in nature, uh, function, um, sort of. Uh, uh, not that it has a light or that it uh, warns sailors away from the shore. But in the in the attitude that it's manned has to be manned 24 hours a day, and is there for the protection, then yeah, I would say lighthouse in nature. Um, that's one where a remote viewer should probably go back and say, oh, how is it lighthouse in nature, and get more 
descriptors about it. Ranger operated, yep. Um, Adriondack type furniture, no. Uh, strong design, yeah. Very old, as in a century or more, no. Black and white photograph, uh, no. It is gray, though. I keep trying to scroll and I can't. <laughs> um, Sorry. Black and, okay. Uh, also, small. Cement parking area. Um, cement parking area, absolutely. Small, no, that place was huge. Okay, the sp space, community post like, yep, meeting, vibe, uh, yeah, uneven usage of sporadic business, yes. Uh, very busy, then completely empty, yes, and, oh, that's perfect. Uh, way markers, yeah, waiting area, refuge, regroup, refresh, double check, oh, all perfect, yeah. The space, um, <clears throat> ham radio operating. I wouldn't say ham because ham is uh, civilian, but as far as non-public radio operating, yes, absolutely. Nature-based, weather watchful, tra tracking, yep. Map following, energy exerting, um, gaining bearings. Oh, this is perfect. Okay, the motion, looking out. Checking in, anchoring, oh, I like that. Uh, supply counting, yep. Stocking shelves, yep. Finally here, short resting, go again. Uh, updating conditions, tracking visitors. Mostly waiting, boring, yeah. Then complete the opposite, fast moving rescue made. <laughs> I think no, I've got the target. <laughs> Okay, biologicals, male, outdoorsy, uh, preparation identifiers, keen awareness, uh, signal catchers, yeah. Uh, database, environmentally trained, yeah, conserved, yeah. Uh, prime of their lives, yeah. Uh, I got lost here. Oh, there. Uh, season oriented. Uh, Guardian like. Uh, huh? Yeah, oh, season. Sorry. Season oriented. I'm not sure how many seasons they have in Florida. I think it's one. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, guardian like, yes. Condition of spokesperson, uh, service driven, yep. Uh, safety net issue. Yep. This work is in their views, is in their veins and runs in family lines. I don't know about running in family lines, but yeah. Uh, Many Navy people have fathers or grandfathers or whatever, or uncles that were Navy. Uh, the water, small rock pool, no. However, where we were, there was a small rock pool that actually led to immediately deep water where the ships were. Trickling falls from above, no. Uh, Tank man -made. I'm not sure about that. Uh, for North and Twisting Narrow River, River. No, I can't be back on that. Um, stray cat list, okay. Uh, grouping stairs, huge tree stump, planetary rings like Saturn. Yeah, these are all stray cats. Uh, you might find out on each one of those what the kernel was that actually caused you to identify Devil's Mountain. Is it the big, huge, flat place? Uh, who knows, Butte, Montana, tall cactus? Uh, uh, could be, you know, that you got impressions of those things sticking up that you immediately identified. But look at each one of these. These are nouns. Uh, they just... Uh, I, I'm glad to see that you're setting the nouns aside. That the ability to set them that. aside. Yeah. We stress that they reminded you of something possibly, but don't dwell on them, don't buy into them. That's and right. when you get to P5, if you want to do a P5 on them, you know, go ahead. But mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, we don't buy into them, but we stress that there might be a kernel of something there. 
that yeah, reminded there, you of something. There usually is a kernel of something there, and so it's good that you log these in. Um, uh, Boy Scout meeting, yeah. Uh, there's a saying in the military, you know the difference between the Boy Scouts and the military? Boy Scouts have adult leadership. Uh, anyway, American flag, yeah, sunshine flag, blue and yellow, I'm not sure. I don't know um, a flag that is for the sunshine the state. Yeah. yeah uh, follow me, boy, look at that. That's military. That's, that's military, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Firehouse that's news. That's a P7? Yeah. Uh, that yeah. a P7? Yeah, that's a P7, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, Pony Express. Yeah, there's a lot of good information in here. And then and she just put a lot of notes in. Yeah, I think it shows uh, the main thing. The main thing is, did you access the target? And I think this definitely shows that she accessed the target. And once you access the target, then learning how to use the controls is where you get the details, like nouns go to the side, uh, you know, and and if you get uh, a sound, you identify it as a sound rather than a smell or, or whatever. Uh, raspy can be a sound, it can be a texture, uh, whatever. And so, you know, you identify these things. Um, but this shows that you are absolutely in touch with the target. Once you get in touch with the target, hey, that's, you know, that's the main thing. From then on, it's just looking around and telling what you see. Good Michelle, session. did you, yeah, thanks for sending in that session, and I agree it was a, a good, great session. And did you want to say anything or make any comments, Michelle? I'm just rotating uh, mice again so that some of the folks, uh, John's coming up and he'll probably want to have a mic. So. Good session, Michelle. Thank you. All right, let's see who's. I'm just kind of going down. Okay, and I'll make sure I have these in order. Okay, John Stewart's up. And his first session plus a retasking. And All right, here is uh, a 10 page session. Here is his first sketch, which he has labeled. And which shows the site orientation problem. Did you notice that, Teresa? Uh, yeah, we, we haven't upended, it looks to me like. You flip this 90 degrees to the, to the clockwise, and mm -hmm. you've got the ship, yeah. <laughs> uh, the site orientation problem is a very common problem among remote viewers. And uh, and what it does, you may wind up at the site laying on your side or whatever, and then you describe what you see. And if you're laying on your side and the uh, target is like the Eiffel Tower, you're gonna see it as a long horizontal thing with a point on one end and, and you know, four points spread out on the other end, but you'll see it horizontal. And would, uh, you, would you recommend, Lynn, just every every session, every time when you take those first coordinates, to just give yourself a move command, turn and face the target, and describe, and it would automatically put you in the right position. It may do that, and uh, a lot of people have that policy. It's uh -huh. a good policy. What I generally like to do is anytime I've done a sketch, then I will uh, uh, give a move command, and it's just you know move one inch closer to the target and describe. And the move command will generally, almost always, 
solve the uh, site orientation problem. And uh, and so you do your sketch, you give the move command, excuse me, you give the move command, and suddenly you see everything differently. You know that the site orientation problem happened. Uh, you still see everything the same, then you can generally pretty well believe that what you sketched was uh, oriented correctly. And just so everybody has a chance to see here, uh, he has some timelines where he's, um, how tall is the man-made, and we'll, he'll address those down in his summary. Mm -hmm. uh, he, all, he usually does, I say that with certainty. And note what he's done here with these timelines. Mm -hmm. Zero, uh, 10 feet to 1,000 feet. He found it less than 500. So the next line, 10 feet to 500. He found it less than 250. Next one, 10 feet to 250. He found it less than 125, and so on and so on. Until he got down to about 50. Um, there's that. Oh, 140, okay, 150 feet. Yeah. So that's height. He was trying, how tall is the man-made? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he used the pendulum method. Oh, okay. And he's decided that it's 150 feet tall. And actually, it might have that here on the feedback. We'll just take a quick look. Yeah, it wouldn't be that tall, though. I didn't uh, know with those antenna and everything. No idea. Expected? No. Uh -uh. Um, I thought it might. It's 130 feet, feet uh, long mm -hmm. when the foils are up. And so uh, you know once you once you go from the hull, especially if you have the foils down, uh-huh. I wouldn't be surprised. It it and those are pretty be, I don't know how yeah. That's uh -huh. pretty tall. Yeah, it is. I bet if you researched it, you might be able to find it, but it'd probably be in some archive at some point where some guy who served on it yeah. decided to write it up. All right, here is John's summary. Uh, motion biological, man-made, air and space. Yep. Uh, tall. Yeah, tall. I'm not sure. Couldn't feed back on 50 feet. Stationary while we were there. Yeah, tower-like. Yes, vertical, metallic, slightly curved surface, which is blue in color. Um, the one we toured was not. However, you see these others that are battleship gray, and uh, there are times when this seems to have a bluish tint. Especially if you know, if you're on the shade side and and the light's coming from the water, so um, that's that's kind of waffling too. But uh, uh, so the truth is, I do it every now and then too. <laughs> uh, anyway, a uh, man made is thick and heavy with a touristy ambiance, sightseeing ambiance, and foreign ambiance. Uh, I would have to say no, no, and no on that. Um, man-made has mechanical moving parts that are attached to man-made two. Yes, man-made one is opened for operations. Um, I can't feed back on the 78. That may be in the uh, in the text of the target of the week thing there. I actually, I don't think so. I think they were around that long. But there were other, excuse me, I did some reading on this, and I can't confirm 1978, but they had these boats. The design came from other places. Those, if you track that, and that's waffling, I'm not going there. But I'm yeah. saying that he may have latched on to that because these boats yeah. were in use for a while before we got them. Oh, yeah. Not Once these they... boats, but the concept. Yeah, once they figured out how to get the power uh, going forward, even when the ship's out of the water, uh, once they got that problem solved, yeah, hydrofoils came into play pretty strongly.
Uh, boxy, rectangular shape, hollow, thin walled, yep. Um, hard and smooth surface, yep. Man made is white, gray in color with small red portion. Uh, if you look at that top, the, um, all of the emergency equipment is red. See the lifesaver back there? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, the, the third one down. Mm -hmm. Okay. All of yeah. the, uh, yeah. And uh, this was the Coast Guard showboat, and so um, it has the red, white, and blue stripes of the Coast Guard and all that. Um, purpose uh, has a platform-like purpose, yeah. Uh, above ground, yeah. In motion, yeah. Uh, Man-made contains humans, yeah. Touristy ambiance for this ship, which was their showboat. Uh, Could be, but uh, uh, I mean, it was in service too. So, you know, at any moment, that thing could shoo everybody out of the way and take off. Um, and made two is a test of man made one. Motion is rising, slowly repeating, mechanically powered. Yep, biological, human, two in number. Um, several people got two in number. Um, and females, uh, we did not get, we did not see any females. However, it was Paul Smith, Linda, and myself, the Linda that was in the unit, not my wife, uh, uh, who were there on this uh, tour. And so uh, there was, you know, as far as we were concerned, there were two two guys and a woman. Adults under 30 years old, one human is Asian descent and human is Caucasian descent. Uh, I'm not sure, I couldn't feed back on that because we didn't meet the entire crew. Um, close together and inside man made too, yep. Stand vertically, yep. Uh, touristy ambiance again, fun ambiance, I would definitely, I would say no. But I would give anything to be on that ship when they dropped the front hydrofoil and went totally underwater. <laughs> now, far be it from me to fight with you or argue with you or have anything to do with waffling. I know I you, you never kinda did. You kind of enjoyed this, didn't you? Oh, well, yeah, we did. Yeah, sightseeing. Uh -huh. and, yeah. Uh -huh. and who is the outbounder at this exercise? Well, that was Paul, myself, and Linda, yeah. So this is true. You're the outbounder talking to us. Did you have a good time? Yeah, and so here, the touristy ambiance, yeah, I think that would, I'll go back and say, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sightseeing ambiance, we were definitely there for that. Uh, outdoors, warm temperature, dimly illuminated inside, yeah, with urban-like ambiance, yeah, uh-huh. Uh, there are mechanical sounds emanating from man-made, some musical sounds, possibly from man-made. Yeah, uh, they were playing music. Um, foreign ambiance, I would have to say no. With point sources of man-made lighting shining in the background, yes, absolutely. Uh, so a lot of good information here. A uh, dumb question. This is a dumb question on my part. Okay. Foreign ambiance with point sources of man-made lighting shining in the background. Dumb question. Did any of these ships come from another country location, and did you have spotlights on them? I don't think so. And the man-made lighting, uh, mm -hmm. point sources of man-made lighting shining in the background, uh, they have that in the control place. Mm -hmm. um, they do not want strong lights in there, and almost all of the lights in there are point source lights that will shine down on a mapper's position or radio operator's position, and the rest of the place is sort of in darkness. So uh, uh, foreign ambiance, I would say no. Uh, maybe foreign to the viewer, but Certainly not foreign to well, the US. I thought there. maybe if we were bringing drugs in from one of the, you know, few 70 miles away areas or something, you know, 
that would be foreign. So no. Didn't know. I didn't know. I don't think I could agree with that. No. Okay. But the there point is, is a man-made lighting. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that looks like he was there. <laughs> I, mean, um, I think for a moment or two, he was he was probably there on board, yeah. Terry is, has a really good point um, about the site orientation. She says, but if he's looking at it from a different point of view, he could have them measuring the length. Yeah, that's true. 133 feet is, you know, close to, yeah, that's close true. To 150. Very good pickup. Yeah, uh-huh. Well then, well, I tell you what, she'll be teaching here shortly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, then John has a repacking session. Let me, there we go. And so I had to find something to uh, have him take a little closer look at. So I asked him to describe the motion that you say is or has aspects of rising, slowly repeating and is mechanically powered. Include any or all detail, any all details and sketches. Yeah. So they do that anyway. They just sketches. Mostly trying to get people to include this wording in their session. It's yeah. Very important. And it's just more like me trying to get people into the reporting mode. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, only five pages maybe, on this recap. Let me Go stop ahead. and address something there. Go ahead. The purist that you find on the Internet will tell you, oh, you can't do that. That's pollution. Well, yeah, it's pollution. You're you're telling them, hey, you got this part right. Give us more information. Is that pollution? Yeah. So, <laughs> what are you going to do? Give another set of coordinates with nothing and hope that they come focusing in on this again? No. This is where you give the front loading, and the front loading saves you hours and hours of work by simply telling you where to put your viewing next. This is and where the rubber hits the road. That's right, yeah. And you find this all the time in operations. You will never find it in research. And so many purists cannot get their brains out of the laboratory. They, they keep wanting to prove this works for the 10,000th time. And so everything has to be double and triple blind and and so on and uh when you get out into the real world it's just not that way okay so here is a sketch opening circular hollow and three motion is hmm he always includes, let's get to his type summary, because then we'll be. Uh -huh. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> Motion, man-made, water, air, and space. Everybody got the water on this one. That's good. Um, forceful, pushing against gravity. Yeah, I like that. Lifting, emanating from man-made, slow, mechanical, working, ambiance, everyday occurrence, ambiance. Um, the only word I would have trouble with there is slow. They can uh, uh, they can drop the wings under the ship when they're moving, but of course when that wing hits the water, it's still vertical, and that's gonna that's gonna just you know slow them down. So usually what they'll do is they will <clears throat> slow the ship down drop the wings, and then take off. Uh, so there is a section of the movement where they have to slow down because they don't want the entire ship to be ripped apart by them going full speed and all of a sudden dropping that vertical wing down into the water. Um, <clears throat> being lifted by motion openings, uh, three in number, I'm not sure how many are shown in that picture. Um, I seem to remember that there were either three or four ships there. Um, I On those foils when they raise up, though, how many are those? Are, I don't know why I'm thinking there's three. Whatever the appropriate term is underneath that boat. Uh, yeah. No, there are actually two. Okay. Um, 
the uh, now I have seen a schematic that has separate foils side to side in the rear, and there would be three of them but on that. But uh, all of them that we saw had the wide wing at the back. And so as far as the outbounder part of it, uh, there would be two in number. Uh, Rumbling sounds, which are loud, yep. Um, gaseous, hot temperature, under pressure, steam like, burning like ambiance, uh, steam pressure, uh, 1800, I'm not sure, steam, Those rocket. Are stray cats. Oh, stray cats, okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, good information in this. Think you did a good job? I think so. Uh, I think so there, too. there was a private message to me. Uh, about this uh, uh, experiment that we held on Facebook and uh, the woman who had done the session, I mean zero. We, we're going to talk about that, I think, specifically. No, no, this isn't the one that you're thinking of. Oh, uh, okay. The had zeroed in on the girl's hair and uh, and I mean just 100% session on one tiny aspect of the picture. <laughs> and so she thought, you know, oh, I'm no good. I'm dirt. I can't do this and all that. I failed and all. What you've got to understand is that every single session you ever do on any target you do will have thousands of things that you don't get. We don't count off for what you don't get. <laughs> and, uh, uh, well, like if you work for the police, they don't care what you don't get. What they care about is how much can they depend on what you did get being true. And, uh, that's, that's their main thing. You know, if you tell them, uh, you tell them there's a gun there, is there a gun? They don't care how many knives might be there. They want to know, <laughs> you say there's a gun, how much can I depend on you to be right? And so uh, we never count off for what you don't get. We only say the stuff that you did get, is it really there? And on this one, the answer is yeah. Uh, this, was, this was a good session with good information. And that's what counts in remote viewing. Uh, John, did you want to comment? Thanks for sending in your session. And you do have a mic. Yeah, and sorry about that touristy part. Uh, we were definitely tourists there. I mean, we were. I official. thought so, but you know. Yeah, we were official tourists, but I was thinking about the ship and. And all that, so, but yeah, you, as an outbounder, yeah, as an outbounder, we were tourists. <laughs> you were the tourist. Worse than that, we were government yeah. tourists. Everybody hates government tourists. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, I think that the point sources of light with a foreign ambiance, I think I had perceived the lights of Havana in the distance that you had described earlier. Oh, yeah, that could be. Uh -huh. And also, um, uh, they go out at night a lot, and they look for the point lights of the ships, you know, coming in from Cuba and and from South America and all that. So um, that's a possibility, yeah. All right, good. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good consideration. This is pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, because those guys work 24 hours a day. They work at night, daytime, every time, you know. Um, there is a session coming in from somebody who, uh, this is from a little twist on similar names here. This is not John Stewart who just turned in a session. This is Stuart Edwards. 
He's not here. I, I don't think he's here. Yes, he is here. Good. Uh, so here you have a chance to observe a different methodology and reporting system. And also, Stuart is the person whose uh, session results I queued you in on because he thought he picked up something that was uh, possibly dangerous, which will happen. And I thought, well, who am I? And just for everyone who's here, uh, I thought, it is not my job as an animal. Because at first I thought, oh, no, no, you know, where are that? And I thought, wait a minute, Teresa, you are doing exactly what you should not do. It is not your place to decide what is important and what is not. And Lynn being the outbounder, I called him and gave him Stuart's uh, results. I said, you know, here's what he's getting. It's not my job to decide what is important or what isn't, and I'm telling you these results. So I did do that. So, Lynn. Lisa? Um, yes. Lisa? Yes. Open your diary and give yourself about 100 gold stars there, okay? <laughs> Very good. Thank you. And I did, and I really did. At first, you know, I was in the instructor webinar role, you know, I'm sitting here kind of weaving in my chair going, Oh, yeah, latte fair. You know, we're just doing a practice target. And, you know, it's okay because viewers fixate on things sometimes and they get all excited and, and, and they get, you know, and they capital build. And I'm like, okay, good. And I even sort of replied to Stuart in along that vein. And then I think I was getting ready to go to work. I'm in my car. It was the next morning. And I'm like, what did you just do? You just blew off a session result. You just analyzed what is important and what you think is important. And it's not about what I think is important. It is what the viewer reports and what the customer knows. Cause they'll, I mean, unless it's totally unknown, which is usually, you know, that happens, but usually the customer knows something. And, and I'm like, customer, wait a minute. Yeah. And the customer is usually not going to tell you everything. Right. And so I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, Lynn is really the outbounder in this. And you'll see in a second uh, what Stuart reported, and I made sure that Lynn got this information just in case. So, uh, Lynn, um, I we have 11 pages here, and Stuart's not used to reporting in CRV format with a summary at the end, I don't think. Let me just see if there's any kind of a synopsis here. He sent me an email that sort of summarize so yeah uh Stuart you um in I'm every scrolling. Session, in every session you're gonna get good stuff and garbage and all that. Everybody does no matter how good you get. And um at the end of the session if you write a summary you can drop out the bad stuff or the stuff you now think is bad once you have good site contact and keep the stuff that you think is good. And what this allows you to do is during your session, whatever comes to mind, you can write it down without fear of being right or wrong, simply because at the end, you're going to throw stuff out anyway. <laughs> and at the end, you're going to have better site contact. You're going to throw out the garbage. And so it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong all the way through the session. You just Get an impression, write it down, and keep going. So okay. uh, that's Sorry. one of the values of a uh, of always writing a summary. Then I would just like to say, uh, Janine is not here, but she is what I call the queen of um, nouns. But yet her sketches, and through Janine, I mean, we've had a lot of really good learning experiences because she likes to name things which Lynn has taught us to peel away the nouns and look at the sketches and look at the perceptions, and she'll have really accurate information. But I would just like to say uh, just briefly that Stuart said from minute one that he thought that he was probably in AOL land. He dearly hopes that he is wrong. He sees some kind of a graduation type of ceremony with someone in the back of the room uh, not having not good intentions. And so I thought, well, you know, Lynn's the outbounder here. What if he, I mean, and, and stuff happens. 
you know, and so I thought I should tell Lynn this. And so as I scroll down to through this, Lynn, I will stop wherever you want me to. But here is his sketch. So a lot of times if he's named things on his sketch that would be incorrect, but this might actually be good sketching of that ship or something. So I'll stop right here and see what you have to say, Lynn. Um, no, I, um, uh, I couldn't go with this at all. Statues, flowers, but, um, uh, also the rows of seats. Mm -hmm. now, this ship is like <clears throat> any Navy ship. Um, uh, there's not a single place on that ship that's not just right and small and crowded and, uh, uh, not for comfort in any way you know um the seats are just extensions of the hull and uh, and no uh, this is uh you know you might have that have something like this on a battleship especially for when they get the entire crew in there and uh and the captain makes addresses the entire crew face to face rather than over the loudspeaker system but um uh, no, this. Uh, and this I'm is, not sure where his AOL started, but there is an element of danger associated with this target. And oh, so yeah. I, I didn't know, you know, from minute one if that grabbed him or what happened. That could be, yeah. Uh huh. Uh, and and Stuart, you have a mic too if you want to speak. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Um, yeah, see, in the, as I wrote down at the very beginning of this um, target, um, it caused me a lot of turmoil, um, yeah. as I put down, down on page one. Um, it's the only target that I've ever, I mean, I've done 60 targets now. This was my 45th target. Oh. And, mm -hmm. and it was the first one, I've been the only one so far that I've come across where I actually struggled to actually put the pen to the paper. And I had real problems physically putting the pen down just to dry do that. Yeah. And it actually took me two sessions on one day, got nowhere. And it was actually on to the third session on the second day, which I recorded on page three of what you're saying, before I could actually even produce any idea drums. You know, um, this may have been because of the active military nature of this. And, uh, I mean, even when they dive under the water and come up with the little cigarette ship on, you know, cigarette boat on their deck, those guys have guns. <laughs> and, and, I mean, they will use those guns. And so, um, like Teresa said, this is a dangerous job. And, in fact, um, uh, uh, some of the bigger ships actually have torpedoes and try to take them out. Uh, I mean, these drug people have all the money in the world. They they buy disposable submarines to uh, to carry drugs, and uh, you know, I mean, who else could afford disposable submarines? But um, yeah, these these guys are active military with uh i mean they're in battle conditions uh just as much as anybody in afghanistan or, or anything like that yes well, one thing i'd like to ask you Lynn, if you don't mind um i played through this because it's for me it's a, an excellent learning opportunity um particularly since i really struggled to put the pen down so I worked my way through it. On the third, second day of the third session, I managed to get about eight, eight ideograms out. Then when I tried to do a ninth ideogram, all I got was a visual image of a, a girl's face smiling. So I sort of took that as a clue that I was finished with stage one, given obviously that didn't really mean a great deal in the context of stage one. Um, then I got the, got my stage through, obviously my stage three, which is quite common with me, is way off. I then plowed it through, and then I started getting this feeling in stage four about this unhappy man, wherever that came from. Then 
what I then decided to do was um, when I'd sort of worked through as much as I could, um, I tend to sort of look at my AOL and try to work backwards from them, as, as we've talked about before. Yeah, good. And so the first thing I wanted to do, this would be on page 11, uh, I actually wanted to write down, uh, I do this in the mind map format, you know, award ceremony AOL. And I couldn't actually work back from that. But if you go to the page before it, page 10, just pull that up for a sec. So this is what I would buy your experience on. Mm. I buy your experience on everything. Okay. <laughs> but um, what I was trying to do here was put in the centre award ceremony AOL. As I was about to write that, the name Arthur appeared. Now, what you're seeing there was a very, very strong, um, clearly nothing to do with the target, as it turns out. But do you have any sort of comments that you could actually make about when you when names and things like that just suddenly appear to you from local? Because I mean, I just found that incredibly strange. Like, if, you, if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll yeah. find I was questioning myself, saying, "Come on, Stuart, there must be imagination." You know, they even said, "Is he talking to me?" Yeah. You know, I was actually saying, "Rationalise, this must be imagination." But it's such a strong feeling that I find that you know, I'm trying to. Differentiate it myself, where yeah. that actually came from. Um, I was trying to kind of speed read as she went through this the first time, and you know, I kept uh, seeing the the smiling girl, uh, and I thought, ah, oh, dirty old man, you know, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, Linda that was with us with Paul and me. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous girl and always laughing and smiling and all that. And uh, I mean, when I say gorgeous, you can underline that in italics and make, and make it all caps. So uh, um, anyway, uh, I my first jump to a conclusion was that you were viewing Linda. Now, um, on, on looking at the rest of this, it sort of looks like, if I were an analyst on this, uh, put on my analyst hat here, uh, from the start of the session and down to here, it looks like some other target that was more important than this one has just used your session as a chance to come in and, uh, and impress itself over you. Many times the subconscious mind will do this Okay. Um, and uh, I know one time I was uh, doing a dog and pony show for uh, for a radio, uh, one of those late night radio shows, and uh, they gave me a target, and the information I got had absolutely nothing to do with the target. But come to find out, uh, the next hour after I hung up, uh, I got a call from the police department about a missing child, and I had just done the session to tell where the missing child was and totally missed their dog and pony show target in the process of doing that. And so uh, when, when, they, when they called and said, we have a missing child, you know, missing teenager, that's when I realized, hey, I just got through doing the session on that. I read them the results, and uh, I got feedback later saying, yeah, that's exactly where she was. And this happens. Uh, yeah. um, that looks like what may have happened here. Uh, I'm not so, sure. Yeah, so it just, it just interests me. I mean, while it's nothing to do with this target, very, very briefly, this was target. This is my 45th target I've ever tried. Mm -hmm. and never had that experience before. Um, my 59th target I did on the 25th of this month, which um, I can't talk too much about at the moment. Again, the name Arthur came through. So it's interesting what you say, how that sometimes happens. Yeah. Um, because, um, interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, for, for me, I'd rather just discount that. Um, well, two, two, two sessions now that that specific name has appeared from nowhere. Oh, then, um, then you can see it again. That's unusual. That's unusual. Yeah, you I mean, can I, see I, that I, again. 
uh, yeah. uh, probably in real life. Uh, you're going to see that name again then. Um, yeah, this is, there's something important that's just uh, using your sessions as an open door to just come busting in and uh, and take over. And usually that's very important and you want to pay attention to it. Because okay. your subconscious knows what is important and what's not. Okay. Lynn, do you have any suggestions for him? So that I understand what you're saying, and this is important. So now that he's not going to look for Arthur behind every bush, you know, because uh, Arthur uh, might be important. Uh, could I could find Arthur there whether he wants to or not? <laughs> right. And how can he view without having this? How can he concentrate on the session that he's supposed to be doing without this happening? And I'm sorry, Stuart, go ahead. And I was just going to say, by way of background, I haven't done anything for the past five years. I've had a complete rest. Mm -hmm. But between the millennium and 2009, I was quite aggressive and proactive in exploring esoterics um, along the hermetic line, which you may or may not understand. But it's, yeah. it's, not, to it's not totally dissimilar to the fundamental energies which sure. underlie remote viewing as far as I can tell. Um, back in that decade, I was rather quite good um, at, at certain specific things. Didn't involve anything to do with names or anything like what's happening just now. But the point I'm trying to say, Teresa, is in terms of feeling self-confident, comfortable, in terms of uh, not worrying about strange esoteric things that happen, I don't. <laughs> well, that's good. Um, I've, I've, had a, I've had a lot of practice in um, predicting things in the past which have proven to be accurate. Yeah. That, um, that what Lynn's trying to explain to me, no, is not something I find worrying or unusual. I'm just trying to make sense of it in the RV context. Yeah. Um, but I, as I, I say, the thing is that if you practice this every day and do it professionally and all that for the next 30 years, Yes. That session that will be a total surprise to you will still hit you, <laughs> no matter how good you get, no matter how uh, experienced you are. Uh, and, Lynn, I, I, in first time I've done 60 sessions, which I know is a drop in the ocean. Um, I know I'm scratching away at this moment. I would say I really value your experience. Um, I just know from what Teresa said and from an email she sent me that she's uh, I get the impression today there's a, a loving woman who gets a bit worried but sometimes we worry about what we do. Um, and I just want to put a reminder of this that you know, I'm not unduly concerned, I'm just curious as to why. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. But you've answered, Don. Um And to say today, so thank you as well for, um, for being so kind that way. Because um, I mean, I do know some people would really worry and um, screw the noodle about such things. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, when you when a target comes and impresses itself on you like this, yes. go with it. Your subconscious is allowing that to happen because it is important, and uh, you go with it, okay? And yes. if there's some assigned practice target, and that means that you don't get a good score on the practice target, Big deal. <laughs> Who cares? You know. Hey, Lynn, Lynn, believe me, those scores don't actually worry me at all. Good. Um, and as I say, at the moment, I'm actually questioning. So I've actually, uh, my last eight sessions have actually been your practice targets from your website, which until a few weeks ago I couldn't access at all. Um, generally speaking, I'm not doing too bad on them. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I've had ones where I've database, I mean, bear in mind my database is lousy because I'm doing it myself. Um, but yeah, I've had, I've had databasing results as low as 20%. That doesn't cause me a problem. I'm more concerned about the ones I get 90% and I'm thinking, no way is a complete beginner getting 90%. It oh, just is, something's not right. We have, um, we have long past the 100th monkey and we've got, you know, we've got people now who in three days of training are doing many sessions better than we had in in 
six months of training, eight hours a day, five days a week, and then a couple of years of experience. So this is this is snowballing. Um, you look at some of the sessions that were done in the unit, and you know many people these days will look at those sessions and say, "That's it. That's the best they could do." And uh, oh yeah, this is this is taken off. Well, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean my personal view, and no, I don't divert away from the conversation, but my personal view is the reason that's happening is the human race is evolving. And as the human race yeah. is evolving, people are becoming more open to esoteric yeah. skills. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, as remote viewing is coming along through the years with, with what you're doing and everything, it sort of matches the two. And um, yeah, I think it's quite an exciting time for the remote viewing community. Oh, I'm sure they better yeah. at it. <laughs> You know, but um, I know, be, be, being wrong, I'm one, of, I'm one of the few people in life, if I'm wrong, I'd rather you told me I was wrong, which I know it goes against all the theory that's been taught in the remote viewing environment. Yeah, the thing, um, the thing, you know, speaking as a teacher, I yeah. will tell you that if you make a hundred percent on a target and don't learn anything from it, you just wasted your time. I mean, you could have done basket weaving and wound up with a basket, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you yeah. if you make a 10% accuracy and you learn something from it, listen, that was a good session. Uh, don't worry about the score. Oh, I'm not worried about the score. I say, um, I just, um, when you get impressions come through, you can feel a very distinct, a very strong, and they don't seem to be an AOL. You know, you, it's, it's from someone at my beginner stage, it's good to ask why is this happening? Yeah. And um, that's important. Yeah. But, to me, it is Just anyway. remember if they're an AOL, you set them aside and don't dwell on them and you keep moving and you keep writing perceptions down. Yes. Okay. If they're an AOL. I'm okay. still falling into that trap on a daily basis why I'm trying to label. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> One of these times you'll, you'll get tired of falling and you'll like set that down aside and then you'll just go right back to describing. Hmm. Yes. Because your, your nouns are your namers and guessers and they're boxes where you've got all kinds of things that you've learned over life and associations and stuff. And they're a lot of imagination. So don't let them hijack you. Set them aside and keep on viewing. Okay? That, yeah, yeah. I, I totally hear and totally accept all that. My only comment will be for me, as um, as me being me, I, you, I find it incredibly difficult to actually do that. I want to do it. I try to do it. But it still, still, still keeps seeming to come through. Well, um, it's, come it's practice, it's practice, 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 at the end of the day. It's, it's, le it's help, learning how to do it. Let me help you struggle. It, let me help you in your struggle with uh, AOLs. Uh, you get 20 or 30 years of remote viewing under your belt. You're still going to have them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm so, sure. Yeah, so the message is, you know, quit struggling. Just set them aside and move on. But don't fight them because you will not win. I can guarantee you that you won't win. <laughs> Just don't fall into their trap. Yeah, it's human nature. <laughs> and I mean, with that, gentlemen, it is uh, 9:49, and we still have two viewer sessions to go through, and they each have okay. recasting. So okay. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, I really need to move on. Thank you, Stuart, for sending that session in, and hopefully we helped you out. Okay. Thanks. Thank You're you. welcome. All right, uh, this is Bob's session, and he's here and can comment if he wants, um, making sure there are no piped-in comments. Uh, he has seven pages, and I was scrolling down through, and here's his sketch. I'll flip that so that and I knew it. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can count on me. You know that. You know you can. There we go. There you go.
So there you can see his sketch. And he is just now learning um, how to label his sketches and probe them. And so he's kind of trying that on for size before he moves into phase four. And then I will flip this back. I did it. So here is his, thank you. I can get one or two gold stars out of that. Uh, practice, practice, practice. Maybe I'll get it. Um, here you go with his type summary and then he has a retasking and this is, this will be his first ever retasking. So. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is his first session and here's his summary if you want to go through it for feedback. Okay, biological feature, other biologicals, and water. There's your water. Yep. Um, <clears throat> smells clean. Taste of chlorine. You know, I think I would agree with that. I mean, I didn't go up and lick the ship, but <laughs> uh, I think I would probably agree with that. Uh, gurgling, bubbling sounds associated with it. It's cold in temperature. Colors, um, white, light blue, light green and light brown and tan, okay. It moves across and in sideway motions and has a relationship with the water. I think he's kind of nailing a target here. Um, yeah. The bio appears to be floating in a gliding motion and carrying something. It's wet, thin, con content and satisfied. Uh, appears to be a worker that is well Equipped. We're talking about the biological here. This is one uh -huh. of the problems with essay writing. Uh, the the ship uh, the ship the bio appears to be floating in a gliding motion. And um, carrying something. And carrying something. Okay. The bio is wet, thin, content, and satisfied. This may be a descriptor of the ship, but I'm not sure it would be a descriptor of the biological. Um, you know me, I, I really shy away from essay type summaries. Anyway, um, a shipment with a kind of concept, with a concept of production and serving a purpose of transport. Yeah. Uh, get good feeling about the biologicals. Motivation as pertains to its activities. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Structure, earthy smell. The biological smells clean and taste of chlorine. I don't know. Were there anybody yeah. in the water, any any people in wetsuits or anything? I don't uh, know. No, uh -uh. no, not at all. Okay. Anyway, uh, you know, Reading that, I would say, yeah, that describes the ship to a T, but not the biological. Anyway, uh, the structure has an earthy smell and metallic taste. The temperatures are cool, and there are loud crashing sounds present with it. Uh, there was just a sort of a reserve motor that runs 24 hours a day that was just sort of drumming, and thr you know, thrumming or whatever you call it. Um, <clears throat> There weren't any crashing sounds. Now, in operation, this may have a lot of crashing sounds. I don't know. Uh, the structure is silver, dark green, which are brightly um, illuminated. Okay. Uh, there is a concept of production with the structure and also the agricultural uh, significance. <laughs> yeah, they grow in pot. That's true. Yeah. And uh, meaning along with the assembly line position to its organization. Um, there was an assembly line organization uh, as these ships are sitting there in the water. That's true. Um, and when they're when they're out active, they also don't go generally side by side. Uh, they'll sort of hang back but you know in sort of a I guess one side of a V shape or something like that. Um, structural comfort contains brick, no. Uh, it's square, no. Flat in shape, yeah. Tall. 
uh, multi-storied in height. Actually, that's true uh, because you have the hold of the ship, you have the uh, above deck parts, and it is multi-storied. Yeah, um, and long in length. You bet. Yeah, there are many windows uh, incorporated within the structure. Actually, the only windows are in the uh, conning tower there, the uh, uh, control room, and they look forward, <clears throat> uh, and they're large. Um, within the structure, it appears that the structure is lone standing in relationship to other things at the target. Now, um, site, and there are trees close by. Now, this could be, you know, going back to where we were at the outbounder time. We were not at this building here that's shown in that picture. We were at a humongous uh, flat area that is for uh, pulling ships out of the water and working on them, putting them back into the water, uh, boat ramp some of the biggest boat ramps you can ever even imagine, um, and a just a huge flat area. Now, the building that uh, was shown, there was a tall multi-storied building far distant across the uh, across that flat area. Um, have no idea what it was, and we didn't even get near it. It was just sort of off in the distance across that flat area. So um, he may have zoomed into that. The ambience at the structure, and, and of course, there are palm trees all over the place there. Um, the ambience at the structure is busy with tangible shipments of some kind being handled here. Um, not where we were on the outbounder, on the outbounder thing. And the, uh, the huge boat area was for military ships only. Uh, now, they stock supplies for the crew and for, uh, you know, for their operation. But other than that, uh, no products of any kind, you know. Um, there's an industrial purpose, and it appears to me like a warehouse plant for processing packaging of goods. I have relaxed feeling about the activity present at the structure. Um, if he has zoomed in on that large building way off in the distance over there, he could be totally accurate. I have no way to feed back on it. Biologicals at the site are workers, staff at the structure. Yeah, you bet. Water is green in color. Yep. Uh, vast in length. Yep. Uh, wide in depth, um, yet forms a channel that is directly associated with the structure and is very close to the structure. This is true. Uh, the water helps in facilitating transport to the structure. Absolutely true. That last uh, paragraph there, well, the last two paragraphs, 100% uh, correct on those. Uh, the paragraph above that, there is an awful lot that I really can't feed back on because I'm not sure whether he was attracted to that large building across the way or not. And from the sketch, it looks like he might have been. But there was a tasking, retasking yeah. on it? Yep. Um, and this is the first time he ever tried retasking. So tell me more about that, which you say is the structure with an assembly line positioning to its organization. Include any all details that you may find. I may not be able to feed back on any of this, but uh, that's good because it will find out whether or not he actually went over to that uh, huge building across the way. Okay, uh, summary. The uh, predominantly red and brown in color, no, it was gray. Um, the dimensions of the structure are square, yep, large, yep, with old historical background attached to it, yep. Uh, the sounds associated are loud and noisy, 
Yeah, uh, charged energetic atmosphere of work being done by biologicals at the site. Yeah, there were people over there, you know, just like any military place, just working in, you know, full-time work. Physical composition of the structure is predominantly brick and stone. Can't feed back. It was gray. I don't know what it was made out of. Uh, cinder block, cement, I, I have no idea. It's physically guarded with weapons. Yep. Um, the structure is located in America. Yep. Uh, Stray site of Fort Knox and Federal Reserve. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, those are stray cats, so yeah. And it's good that they're set aside. Concept of processing, preparing, packaging, and war. I cannot feed back on any of that. We didn't go anywhere near that structure. Uh, the ambiance of the structure is official, governmental, and traditional. Yep. The emotions of the biologicals is patriotic. Can't feed back on that either. If you've never heard a sailor bitch about <laughs> the Navy, then you know, who knows? <laughs> and Bob is here. Let me see if I had taken his mic away. Oops, where's he at? I was positive he was here. Hmm. He was here. At some point, he had to go. Darn, he had a great session. I keep thinking I'm missing him in the crowd someplace, but he is not here. Okay, um, that leaves us with Terry. Thank you, Bob, even though you're not here for sending in that session. I've already and sent Terry's uh, session. You have? I have. She sent it to me personally, and... Uh, she said she wasn't going to be here tonight. Oh. I'm glad she's here. Okay. I think. I think this is the one I was... Um, I don't know. may not be. I'm... It's not her yeah. usual MO. I'll put it yeah. that way. Yeah, this is the one. Uh-huh. Okay, you saw this one? Well, no, maybe I didn't. Because. Remember that. You sent Lynn the retasking? Oh, because you thought that it compared with the. Okay, um, retasking, okay. With the uh, other thing. Yeah, no, I didn't see this one. No, this is her first session. Okay, yeah. So, with her sketches, I'm going down through this to get to. Her 13 pages were coming up on, because she builds on her sketches. Mm -hmm. So that's her, I think, last sketch version. And then here is her summary. Let me make it a little bit bigger. It's too big. This won't. I can fix it. Can you read that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. Box-like rectangular structure instructed to hold biologicals, yeah. Uh, rectangular, no. Um, constructed wood, no, is fairly plain and unadorned. Amazingly, yes. It's complexified. I mean, it's a complex target, but it is basically plain and, ado and adorned on these ships. Now, the one we were at was painted with the Coast Guard symbol, you know, Coast Guard stripes and everything else. And uh, even still, other than the uh, the uh, list of seizures that they had gotten, it was not adorned. It was painted white. But it was still, there was no adornment on it. Yeah. Um, well, it may have a possibly black marking on it. And um, it did. It had a black hole. 
um, which I think you can see in that picture anyway. Um, exterior is light colored, either off white or possibly a light kind of ugly, gray greenish colors, very boxy. There may be some kind of grid design at the opening situated at one end. <laughs> she did get the, uh, the, the seizure panel there. Um, it's possibly made of a mesh wire material. No, um, they cover the opening. Overall construction seems rudimentary. Box-like structure may be slightly elevated off the ground by four posts, one at each corner. Um, there may be additional protected mess openings at the bottom of the box, and no on almost all of that. Uh, there's a much darker inside. It is much darker inside the structure. Absolutely true. Uh, feels like layered material coats inside the structure. Yes. Uh, this coating may form geometric patterns. Um, these ships are generally double hulled, so that if anything penetrates the outside hull, it still won't sink the ship. Um, uh, coating may geometric patterns, octagonal, uh, possibly, I'm not sure what that would be. Um, feels like it's possible to enter each of these shapes a bit. Like each one forms a depression? No, not really. Uh, each shape may provide an individual nesting place or house individual biologicals? Probably so. And in fact, it's possible to enter each of these shapes. Uh, maybe talking about the sleeping bunks inside the ship. I'm not sure. Uh, this That's says. Right. Without knowing, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah, because this is in the paragraph that says darker inside the structure. And Just so, like Ron fixated on the galley, I'm yeah, wondering exactly uh, what you're saying. Yeah. Or storage uh, area, you know. Yeah, this, this may all be, considering that first sentence in this paragraph, this may all be right on. Um, each shape may provide an individual nesting place. Yeah, I I think that's what she's done. She's gone inside the ship and uh, given good descriptions. Um, this keeps jumping. Uh, taking place with some of these shapes, which involves some kind of burrowing in feel. Um, yeah, I think that's what she's done. Gone inside the ship. If so, that's that's very good. Um, Geometric shapes formed within the box, but it's not clear if these man-made or some other type of biological themselves, honeycombs or nests. I think that may be a just a sort of trying to figure out more about yeah. the yeah about the shapes. Um, yeah, she's analyzing. Yeah. Uh huh. But yeah, yeah it, at the same time, she's trying to describe as in. That's right. Uh huh. Yeah. Movement element consists of the feeling that you know, creatures are flying from many directions and entering the box structure. No. Once inside, it feels like working activity takes place, yeah, and as well as in nurturing. <laughs> um, maybe it's a different Navy than one, the one I've heard of. <laughs> uh, the natural element con consists of the feel of some natural material produced within the box, which may be some kind of food. That may be the galley. I don't know. Um, biological consists of a large number of creatures which entered the opening of the structure. It feels like they enter from all directions, like they're flying in various angles. I think she's got some kind of a bird's nest going here. Um, seems tight to me. Yeah. Uh, the box serves as a home base for the biologicals, and also some type of work is done or a goal is met inside the box. I think that says, um, uh, hopefully it's kind of scratched out to now. Uh, once inside the box, the biologicals feel like they move out in every direction to their appropriate spot. Yeah, they each have specific jobs to do. Uh, a ship is not a place where any one person 
generally can do every job. Everybody has their job, their position on the ship, and that's what they do. Gray, green, and gold. I'm not sure about the gold, but yeah. Um, target feels like an industrial purpose. It's like the combined effort of both people and creatures. Um, no, I think she's still trying to build a bird's nest here. Um, it she feels says like she uh, thinks of a beehive the whole time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, feels like a great deal of activity is involved in production of possibly food. No. Uh, any production of food would be by one member of the crew. That's it. Uh, and probably since these ships are always in port, everybody just brings their lunch. I doubt that there's a, a cook on the ship at all. Um, feels like there's a spot that people could view from a distance. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll get her session up. And this is the one I thought, um, I emailed her and said that what she thought that it had a large resemblance to the target that you just did on Facebook with the paint or the kite, the kids flying the kite. Yeah. And I like, no, this isn't a kite flying event. However, those ships flying through the water and having all the um, underneath. You'll see her session. You already seen the she emailed you. Session. And uh, yeah. I, I took the liberty of scoring her session. Yeah. Once you drop out the parts that I can't feed back, every description in this in this retasking session, except the rocks underneath, um, uh, is just right spot on. spot on. I tell you, uh, this is, you know, if it hadn't been for those rocks, this would have been a 100% session. This is perfect. Um, consists of a large, of single object that is four-sided rectangular shape. It, oh, um, Lynn, is, before you... Just so you, the, everybody else listening, Terry was saying, like, am I off target? Why does this resemble? One more time, Lynn put a target up for everybody on Facebook, and he gave the challenges, like, I paint paintings, and I don't know what I'm going to paint until I start. And so I'm going to put it out here now. You send me your session in. And then I'm going to do the session and or the painting and show it to you on such and such a date. Yeah, but I didn't ask them for the sessions. Okay. So you were going to show the sessions and people. Yeah. And you were said to show the feedback. You were going to show them the feedback. And yeah. so the painting that you painted was two or three kids flying a kite. Yeah. So when you go down through this session, and you think about what she's describing, think of the similarities between kite flying and what she is about to describe insofar, excuse me, with these boats. But. And, and don't, and I said, you're gonna learn tonight a really good lesson on describe, don't identify, and don't analyze in session, which she right. did a great job. If you overlay the two, you're gonna have a huge amount of conceptual Similarities. So I'll show you now, please. Thank okay. you. The overlay of two targets is a trick that your subconscious mind does. <clears throat> and what it will do is it will say, you know, like in that other target, it was elevated. And that other target, there was uplift. In that other target, there was such and such. And your mind, your subconscious is very, very smart. It's not, it's not a dumb child. And so when it tends to uh, remind you of a target you've already had, it will remind you of certain parts of that target that tend to describe the target you're viewing. And so here again, you get an impression, you write it down, you trust your subconscious mind because it is doing the viewing. And so, um, <clears throat> so in these sessions where where you just have some other target that is just uh, haunting you, uh, go with it. 
your mind is trying to tell you something. Write it down and keep going. And uh, that's pretty much what happened here. Um, the is open within an airy, lightweight material. Uh, is attached primarily reinforced frame construction. That's true of both a kite and a ship. Uh, like colored ske covered skeletal construction, uh, there may be some type of geometric pattern affiliated with this, uh, either in its construction pattern or it's decorated with geometric patterns. It feels as though it's situated very high in the air, which this is. Uh, uh, the pictures of these ships, um, can you go to the to the top picture and the thing, uh, Teresa? Yeah. No, oh, I mean, that yeah, yeah, the yeah, go go to the top picture there. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. This looks like it's just up on some legs and all that. Look at the front of the ship and go to the back of the ship. That's a hundred and thirty-three feet, <laughs> and. This thing is like 10 feet, 10 or 12 feet out of the water. Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it's very high. And so, yes, this thing is high out of the water. The kite is high off the land. And so you're getting your mind saying, you know, like this other one, like this other one. And, uh, your, your mind will mix these targets but it will select those things which are accurate about both targets. And uh, it took us a long time to to figure this out, but it's a neat trick your subconscious has, and, uh, hey, you can depend on it. You go with it. Okay, you can go back to the summary. Okay. Uh, the force element consists of some type of force acting on a rectangular man-made from below. Okay, feels like an invisible strong force that's continually pushing up the man-made, holding the man-made aloft, holding it up and not allowing it to descend. It feels like this force pushes straight upwards from below, but at the same time, there's a whirling energy that also seems involved in keeping it up. The uh, energy reminds me of swirling, whooshing wind, and uh, you can see off to the right there those uh, turbo water jets that are going and uh and yeah the the wishing sound yeah this energy reminds me of swirling wishing wind the energy causes the man-made also to have a bubbling up quality like multiple lots of bubbles expand and cause the man-made to rise um and uh, okay, there's a feeling of something being cast upwards, swinging upwards in a possible arc, but the movement seems restricted to a certain point. These um, these wings generally rest out of the water, and they are just on a big hinge, a uh, humongous hinge, and when they lower down into the water, they lower down in an arc, just like a swing would, and when they come to a point directly beneath the ship, that's as far as they can go. So the movement uh, is an arc, but the movement is restricted to a certain point, like it only goes so far and then it stops its forward arc. Feels like a repeated movement, but not the same like a swing would be, just the same type of movement. Biological consists of uh, what feels like a set of biologicals, possibly one male and one female. And like I say, we didn't meet any females on the ship, but we did have one female with us. Uh, and you get Linda around sailors. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I won't go there. Uh, working together in some way. It feels like they're both involved with the control of the above man-made. The bios feel grounded, not airborne, and far below the man-made. They're in the hull of the ship, yeah. It feels like they're observing the actions of the man-made. It feels like there's some type of instrumentation involved in their activity within the man-made, which may be handheld. 
Uh, it feels like the bios involved are sending directed energy up to the man-made. It reminds me of flying a remote-controlled airplane. This is the part that uh, I just took out and could not feed back on. Uh, I don't know if any part of this is remote controlled. I know the conning tower has the controls for the entire uh, thing and the people in the control tower there run the entire ship from there. Even the weapons, even the uh, missile tubes, the radar, everything else. So I really couldn't feed back on that. I didn't feel comfortable about even guessing on it. Uh, flying a remote controlled airplane, the uh, biologicals may be standing on or near something moist that seems soggy and mushy. Uh, the air temperature seems cool and breezy and a little gray or overcast. Uh, it was semi that way while we were there, uh, even though it was in the summer and very hot. It was not cool, but there was a breeze. Uh, overall, this target seems to take place out of doors in an open area. It involves some type of flying activity. The biologicals seem a little purpose driven. Um, feels like the biologicals are engaged in an entertaining activity. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that part, but that it requires serious attention or intent and control. Absolutely true. Um, so you see how much of this target could describe kite flying, a uh, mechanical flying machine. <laughs> yeah, I love that part. Um, she has a straight cat of kite. Yeah, she does. Uh -huh. uh, but um, and I think, I'm not sure, I think she did this before I revealed the... Yeah, before I revealed the kite picture. Yeah, she did. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, and so the fact is she didn't know uh, what either target was. Uh, like I say, uh, quite often, I'm not often surprised anymore by what I see remote viewers do. But if I ever quit being amazed at it, it's just, you know, they'll be holding my funeral. <laughs> May 20th, she did this. Um, yeah, uh-huh. And you just turned, uh, just gave that picture today, I think? Yeah. Did I see? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. And so, um, and so, yeah, the, uh, the subconscious is going to mix targets because it's going to do anything it can to get you to pay attention to the information it's given you. When it does that, write it down and keep going. And that's what she did in this session. Now this was, I, I wrote back to her and I told her, this is one where you want to frame each page and put it up on the wall in your office just for future uh, inspiration because this is a good session. I mean, this is fantastic. Thanks for sending that in, ma'am. Nice work. Did you have any questions on it? Uh, and I'm the one with the hair fetish. In your kite target. In your kite. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, the the uh, kite target, she zoomed in on the uh, on the girl's hair which is actually one of the things that I'm going to have to, uh, if I finish that painting, it's far from being finished. Uh, one of the things I'm going to have to do, because if you look very closely at it, it's just lumps of color and shape. Uh, there are no, there's no hair to it or anything. It's just sort of a lump sitting on her head with pigtails flying in the wind and the pigtails are just little round lumps. Uh, so uh, she zeroed in on the hair, but everything she described about it was accurate too. Uh, two good sessions. Two 
She tends to doorknob. She's right. She does. All right. She's practicing. That's good. Yep. For those who wonder about the word doorknobbing, um, I was uh, given a target once when I first came to the unit, and it was a beaconing target. And at the end of it, well, at, before the target, the session started, two of our people went out to an undisclosed place, and I had to describe where they were. And uh, uh, I got this house that was brown and white and, and so on. Well, the house was brown and white, and the place was a historic house uh, there in the Fort Meade area. Um, but all of a sudden, I I had noticed that there was a porch, and I went up on the porch and looked into the window, and I saw this gingham-covered uh, table. And when we went out after the session, I went up on the porch, looked in the window, and there was a gingham-covered uh, table. And um, in the session, though, all of a sudden, I saw this gemstone, this diamond. And I focused in on it and just zeroed in on it. Couldn't get away from it and must have done, I don't know how many more pages on just that diamond because I didn't know what it was. And it fascinated me. Well, it was the doorknob on the front door. <laughs> and uh, uh, I got so completely fascinated with that doorknob that I could no longer see the house. And uh, so, Razzing me about it was what caused the beginning of the term doorknobbing. Well, now we know where that little bit of trivia came from. Yeah, it was from me messing up a session. Nice. <laughs> well, folks, it is 10.28 p.m., and we really need to wrap this up. Uh, great sessions tonight, and I am so happy that everybody was able to send those in because I think there were a lot of good learning points made. And again, um, we had two different set of coordinates, and everybody still got the target. I wanted to make sure that you all left with that information firmly rooted in your heads, maybe because uh, someday when you're trying to re-explain this to somebody, uh, you will have had a session where you can say, hey, we did that. Uh, we do have a second Outbounder session this month. Uh, the actual Outbounder session happened already on the 21st. We'll be discussing that in June, and I'll be promoting that target and asking people to send in sessions. You'll give yourself move commands just the way you did with this one. And we'll discuss that in June. June is a little hectic. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just sent out an email saying that we get together every two weeks. Well, actually, the next uh, presentation is me next week, I believe, because of the IRVA conference. Uh, our scheduling in June and then with the July 4th holiday, I think, might be a little skewed insofar as our every other week format. So that going on. and so. Uh, just to let everybody know that the Columbus presentation went very well. I had a lot of fun, had about 17 or 18 people at the actual presentation, but a steady stream of folks coming by the booth and um, had a lot, met a lot of nice people and explained a lot of things. And uh, the posters that I shared with everybody that had your sketches on them and some of the uh, 3D modeling tools that Lynn had to teach his students, everybody really enjoyed looking at those because uh, they they couldn't quite, they could, I mean, I, and there were a lot of people there who knew about remote viewing. Skip Atwater had been up a few years back and a lot of folks had, uh, had studied with Dave Morehouse or been to seminars and such. So Columbus went very well, had a great time, and the IRVA conference in Vegas is coming up in June. And if you can make that, I would highly encourage it. And other than that, um, I think that's all I have. And we probably need to call it a night, John Boy. That's your cue. 
Good night, John Boy. All right, Lynn is I'm evidently. Sorry. I have. I was muted. I have one That's more right. comment to make, and it's very short. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, this outbounder experiment was mm -hmm. an outbounder in the past. Mm -hmm. You can do an outbounder uh, in the present, and you can also do an outbounder in the future. And so that's a little something for you to think about before, you know, while you're thinking about the outbounder experience. Okay, I'll quit. The future one, though, although the future one, though, you have to be around to give feedback. Right. However far into the future it happens, you have to make sure that at that future time, whether it's one year, two years, 40 years, you're around to, to have a concrete, whether it's a newspaper article or something to show people. And so uh, that's kind of. Actually, you don't to do the session and do a good session, but. If you're going to score it and get your feedback, yeah, right, you have to be there. Right. <laughs> so that you know, that uh, I just wanted to make that point. So. Right. Okay. Sorry to interrupt there. That's all right. Uh, and with that, um, good night, everybody. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you. Whoever's coming next week for my presentation about topology and uh, cultural uh, aspects of what you see at a location and how it ties in and helps you with that location description and some specific examples. And we've kind of been working on that at intervals since January. So a little more reinforcement of that concept. So thanks again, and we'll see you in a week. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night.